Well, good afternoon. I know we're all excited. And welcome. <laughs> Madison Council members and guests. And again, this year has been a wonderful, wonderful year uh, with your support. And it's had such a great impact on the library. And the exhibit that we hope you will enjoy was made possible by your support, the innovative and engaging Baseball Americana. We were so delighted when it was voted by USA Today as the number one exhibit to see this summer, the only one in Washington, D.C., out of 15. So we were just... And you'll see that shortly. And then the 18th National Book Festival, record-breaking attendance over 200,000 people in one day in the, um, I still commute from Baltimore, so excuse me, do do that. Um, the Washington um, uh, Convention Center, and it was held on Labor Day weekend, and the crowd was just wonderful, and that also was made possible with your generosity. And that's just two examples of what the Madison Council does for us. And today, uh, actually, is being made possible by two of our Madison Council members, um, Tom and Joyce Moorhead, who are friends with someone I think you're going to be excited to hear from. And we are in for a special treat because today we have Mr. Henry Aaron and his wife, Billy. And I have to tell you, if you want to know about um, devotion, her birthday is right now. And because of their friendship with the Moorheads, the baseball Americana, respect for it, she said she would be here. Well, unbeknownst to her though, her dear friends, and they call themselves like a kitchen cabinet, who've been together for years and her sisters and everything, they usually celebrate their birthday, her birthday together. And they fooled her and said they were going to Las Vegas. Well, they're all here. And they fooled her and they're here with us today. So we thank you, Mrs. Aaron, uh, for sharing that with us. And so now, yes. And so now, and I'm, I must say, I'm pretty nervous because when I was 10, I wanted to be a shortstop. And it's been in the paper, I've said it with this exhibit, you know, I spent summers in Springfield, Illinois, going down to St. Louis with my grandfather. And I thought that, well, you see, I'm here as the Librarian of Congress. That didn't work out. But I've can't tell you how delighted I am to be able to welcome to the stage Mr. Henry Aaron, someone who has shown in his life and in his deeds what being a champion really is. And so today we are honored that he will talk a little bit with us about his experiences, Mr. Henry Aaron. And I also should mention that I was such a uh, baseball fan that when my parents got divorced, I had a few players I thought if it wasn't going to work out with my dad, then she could marry. <laughs> you know, Maury Wills, you know. I had, I had a few lined up for. <laughs> so thank, thank you, Mr. You. Aaron. Oh, we got, we got, we mic you up. We, we thought you could sit down. Oh, yeah. Thank you. We're going to pretend like much. this is just Thank you. the two well, of us. Let me just talk it together. Before, I just like to thank some people here, if I may, for a moment. I'd like to thank the Moorheads, Joyce and Tom, for entertaining the, the kitchen cabinet, <laughs> and especially all of the people that is involved with my, making my wife's birthday what it is. You don't know what that 
pressure that takes off me. <laughs> but no, I, I want to thank you guys. You guys uh, are really somebody special. Tom, you enjoy. Thank you very much. And Dr. Hines, I'd just like to thank you. I thank all of the people here that have uh, given me the opportunity to stand here and talk to you for a moment about something that I am very fond of. You know, I, I think about, I don't get a chance to get to Washington that often, but I think about it now and I tell a lot of people that I've come in contact with that, that you don't have to go overseas in order to come and find your roots. So really, you can come right here in Washington, right here to this beautiful building here and understand that what it has to offer. And I just want to thank you for all that you do. You have been instrumental in doing some great things and I am so thankful for it, for you. And of course, things that I've been involved with for many years, aside from the 23 years that I played the game of baseball. But just uh, after the 23 years that I was not involved in baseball, that my life had to go on living, you know. And of course, you know, my mother and my father has passed on since. But you and I was talking just a moment ago. I'd like you to mention that more yeah. about your mother and father yeah. because they were quite instrumental in yes. you being able to endure life right. after baseball. That's right. And That's succeed. Right. That's right. Well, she, my, my father, he built his house. It wasn't that much of a house, but it was ours. And he built it uh, with himself. That just with this, the three of us, really, with my, was me and my brother, my older brother and him. He did it on Saturdays between jobs. He was working with the Alabama Dry Dock and Ship Building Company. In Mobile? In Mobile, Alabama. And wasn't making much money, but we built our home with ourselves. Wasn't much of a roof, I must say, that we did the best we could. On some rainy days, we didn't <laughs> completely fill in all of the hot holes. <laughs> we slept under some drops. <laughs> but we did the best we could. We did the best we could, and it was ours. That's the most important thing, yeah. And I understand that even when you achieved so much success and everything, that your father, and you tried to get him to leave that house, Oh, no, and he would not, oh, God, he would not leave that for nothing. He was, uh, he was determined that it was his, and he was going to stay there. In fact, after I had been in baseball for about 15, 16 years, I went back to Mobile, and I tried to buy my mother and father, I, and, and I bought a house for them. My mother loved fishing, and she had a special way of fishing. Now, I don't know... Many of you probably have fished, but she had a special way to fish. And what she did was go on the dock and she'd take a newspaper and ball it up and she would flap the water like this and look, God. The fish she would, would catch fish. Oh, she'd catch all kinds of fish. I tried to do the same thing and they ignored me. <laughs> they wouldn't think about me. But, but she had some special way of doing that. But uh, but I tried to get him to I tried to get him to uh, to move to this little house I had bought for them, and she, he told me one day one one early one morning he was out there trying to crank his car up with his crank and he's and he called me and said come here son I want to talk to you and I went he said listen he said I know what you're trying to do he said you're trying to get your mother and I to move that house that you just bought. He said, but we're not going anywhere. I said, is that right? He said, no. He said, I'll tell you what, he said, 
all of these people here, it's not that many, it's maybe five or six families here in this little area. He said, these are friends of mine. He said, I can wake up in the morning, I can walk down, I can say, hello, Stella, whatever, you know. And he said, these are friends of mine. He said, I'm not going anywhere, he said, so you can take that money that you paid it out and get a refund. <laughs> but but he, he was just determined not to go anywhere. Even he, after you became a successful businessman, and I wanted to bring that up too, yeah. later and everything, he wouldn't yeah. budge. He wouldn't budge. He wouldn't, even, he wouldn't even think about owning a new car, to be honest with you. You know, he loved, Wait a for minute. some reason, I'm, yes. But you were the first he, he loved uh, African-American BMW, and you have a pretty extensive <laughs> background in automobile. Yeah. He, he, no. He want nothing to do with it. He loved cranking his car up. He loved cranking his car up, and he loved people that he walked down the street with, with his overalls, suspended on one shoulder and one hanging down here. <laughs> but that was him. That was him. That was my father. He... And, and God rest his soul, he was, he, was, he was a wonderful man. He did go around, I understand, and I read all the books about you, including your autobiography, yes. I Had a Hammer. And uh, you said that even though he was, would have overalls, there were times when he was popping his buttons and everything. <laughs> he was telling everybody who his son was. Yes. Yeah, he was that. And what happened to the house? The house now has moved to a, a little place called, um, well, it's, it's still in Mobile, but it moved to, uh, to the baseball park. They moved it, and, and that was the most, that's the lonesome, I, I mean, I was, I was in tears when that house was moved. Uh, it moved all the way from Tomanville, which is where I was born in Tomanville, to a little place called Down the Bay, and that's where the house is now set. Two bedrooms, a little place where, and, and you can go in there and see my mother's, believe it or not, her wedding dress many, many, 50, 60, 70 years ago is still hanging in that little room. It's a museum. Yes, it's a little museum, but that's where the house is now. Wow. Yeah. And your mom, as you mentioned, with the fishing, but they also both, the, um, really gave you some values and some things that helped you through some pretty difficult times, even during those 23 years. There were some pretty rough times. Oh, no question about it. I had rough, oh, you mean growing up in Mobile? Well, that was the start. <laughs> that was not. Well, I, you know, and yet my mother always taught me and she told me two things. One thing that you have in, that you have to always remember and be proud of. He said, your name is Henry Aaron. And say, always protect that. I had, and, and, and I, I think about it now, and I think many, many years ago, I said, you know, thinking about Henry Aaron, even when I got into the business of automobile or whatever it was, food business, I always felt like, regardless of what someone tried to tell me, the most important thing was the fact that they may want to come and they can give, show you a big picture of something. But the most important thing is that you always got to remember that your name is Henry Aaron. It's going to always be that. And I've always tried to protect that. And I've tried my darndest to make my mother and father proud of it. You never leave that feeling. Yeah. Of, and you got a chance, and they both got a chance to be very proud. All right. Now, I mentioned those hard times, though, because Mobile, Alabama, that was deep south. Deep People south. People talk about Absolutely. Mississippi and everything, but whoa. Right. We had, we, had, we had rough time. You know, no question about it. When I was growing up in Alabama, I remember, I remember uh, two or three incidents. I remember very well that when it, when it, when it got dark, it was dark, because we had no electric lights. 
And I remember many times when my people with the kitchen cabinet heard me talk about this. But I remember many times that my mother used to call me and tell me to come and get under the bed. And I said, for what reason? Because I'm not doing anything but playing baseball, catching. But down the street was a group of, group of white guys who was the Ku Klux Klan. And they would be coming through your neighborhood intimidating you. Lighting fires, throwing little bundle of lights in your yard, you know, and things like this, you know. And your mother, and my mother would say, that's the reason I wanted you to stay under the house. I mean, under the bed, you know. And so coming out of and, and experiencing that, and then what you had to endure entering into professional yeah. baseball. Because you mentioned oh, you all were playing and everything, but mm -hmm. it was, what, a lot playing or you were just playing? Yes. Yeah, just playing. But then when you got into professional ball, you experienced some of the same things oh, in yeah. a different no way. Oh, yeah, I did. I had the same problem in some cases in cities like Cincinnati. Cincinnati? Oh, yeah, since I had lots of trouble in Cincinnati at one time. I had trouble in Cincinnati. Um, I remember a very dear friend of mine that had been in the service. And this is the first time I told this story. This is the first time he, he had been in the service. And we used to play, back when I first came to baseball, we used to play 150 some, 150 or 150 some games, I think it was. And he used to always take a day off and come visit us in Cincinnati. Well, that was a long time ago when Cincinnati, when you, when you, uh, uh, when you get off out of the airport from the airport, you had quite a ways to go before you get to the to the hotel. And I remember so very well that I remember that the police stopped us, and he had married some lady, and stopped us and told us that we needed to get off the highway. And he told me, he said, and by the way, he said, you need to get out of the car and speak it to me. And I got out of the car, and I remember he said, now when I come back down here, he said, I don't want to see you on this highway anymore, you know. And so I, when he came back down there, I immediately went down in the trenches, the bottom, mud was up to here. Now I'm playing professional baseball. Mud was up to my belt buckle. And I remember that I got to the hotel about two or three o'clock in the morning with mud all on me and everything. But he came back. They came back by with four or five carloads of policemen. And they didn't find me, of course. They had to come down <laughs> and search to find me. But I was able to get to the hotel. And I never did get back to go back in that direction anymore. And that was in Ohio. That was that, yes. Cincinnati, Ohio. So those yes. types of things happen. Oh, yes. yes. During your career, professional, you're going for all these oh, you know, yeah. records and things like that, but there was still that aspect. Oh, yeah, no question. That was part of it. Yes. So then you started thinking, too, about using your uh, fame and position, excuse me, to really help do things. You got a little active with civil rights. Yes. And in, in Atlanta gave a real opportunity. Well, you know, there, there's so many, so many things that, that, um, that I think about as a young man growing up. And I started playing baseball when I was 18. I got to the big leagues when I was 18 years old. I played with Milwaukee from 18 till until the year that uh, they transferred us to Milwaukee, I mean to Atlanta. And playing in Atlanta, Georgia, now Atlanta itself was Atlanta, but outside of Atlanta, you were in Georgia. 
<laughs> little and different. You better huh? recognize that you were in joy. <laughs> so I tried to make myself understood that although, you know, I'm in Atlanta playing baseball, but don't get carried away and think that you're someplace else because you are in Georgia. And I tried to make myself believe that, you know, and understood that, you know. That you were able to start businesses there in Atlanta, and Ted Turner had a. I did. Part of I did. That. I did very well with Ted. Ted and I were very good friends, and I started. I was very lucky. You know, when I said lucky, I mean I was. I wouldn't say lucky. I I think I just took for granted that, you know, baseball was not going to be for me forever. Was going to be with me forever. That I had to do something else in order to make a living. And I wasn't going to play it the rest of my life. So I had to do something else in order to make sure that my life would continue to function the way that I think that it should. But you also thought about others. Uh, we talked about the fact that the Jackie Robinson papers are here. Yes. And what he did in terms of business, but also being active. And you started a foundation. And I love the name. Hank Aaron Chasing the Dream Foundation. Chasing the Dream. And by the way, we have a young lady here who does more uh, handling that than I do. Oh, well, <laughs> there she is. <laughs> She's right here. <laughs> and so Chasing the Dream, I mean, that name. But you know, you know what, yes. what, what started that was the fact that when I retired from baseball, I remember Bud Selig, who was oh. then the, Bud Selig, who is now, he used to, he was a commissioner of baseball, but right then he was the owner of the Milwaukee Brewers. And I remember him, I remember we was playing someplace in Baltimore. <clears throat> and I told a friend of mine, I said, you know, I can't, I, I, baseball is something I'm going to have to give up. I can't. The, the, my longest ball is to the warning track. I slide, and I'm thinking I'm in second base, and I'm halfway. <laughs> I said, I can't do what I used to do. I said, I need to try to think about something else. So I told this friend of mine, I said, I'm, I'm going to retire. He said, well, why don't you go and tell the commissioner? And it wasn't the commissioner. Tell the owner, Bud Seeley. So I went and told Bud Selick about it. And I said, Bud, I said, I, I said, I don't think I'm going to play. I said, you gave me a two-year contract, and that's going to be it. I said, I don't think I can play anymore. He said, well, he said, well, what do you want to do? I said, I want to have, I want to do something, but I can't think of what it is right now. And he said, well, come back tomorrow. So I went back in his office the next day. I said, two things that I don't want. I said, I don't want somebody to come up and say, we got, we're going to have a day for Hank Aaron, and we're going to have a year, go give him a year's supply of Coca-Cola. <laughs> I said, I don't want that. And I don't want somebody to come up and say, I'm going to give him an automobile. I don't want that. No. I said, I want something that I think that two years from now, I'm going to love to be. And my wife said, well, why don't you get a foundation? So I said, okay. So I called it, it wasn't a Chase and a Dream Foundation at that time, it was just Hank Aaron Foundation. Started out little or nothing, doing nothing, making no money, doing nothing. Started out with $200 in it. $200? $200. You were ambitious. I was. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But, <laughs> but we, we, we tried to do the very best we oh, could. Okay. I did the very best we could until one day, I'm getting ahead of myself now. One day, I remember my wife and I was traveling someplace, and she said, You know, she said, Your foundation isn't going anywhere. She said, you, you know, we, we, we ought to try to do something with this foundation. I said, Well, what do you think we ought to do? Let's try and raise some money. I said, Yes, I love that. I said, Let's raise some money. <laughs> that $250 that wasn't going, going no. anywhere. So sure enough, 50. she decided that she was going to get in touch with Coca-Cola, some of the big boys, We're and sure. she talking about some money. Mm -hmm. She went to Coca-Cola and offered Coca-Cola for five seats or ten seats for $50,000 and $20,000. 
And I told her, I said, now don't embarrass me, please. I said, God, I said, that's a lot of money. She said, don't worry. She said, let me handle it. <laughs> and so I said, okay. And so fast forward, I remember the night of the dinner. We had Bill Clinton there. Now I know President I, this Bill is Clinton? not politics. Yeah, President Bill Clinton was there. We raised that night, we raised over a million two hundred thousand dollars. Wow. That night. And that started me on the foundation. I that think started so. me on raising money for the kids. And today we have helped over how many? Wow. Yes. Wonderful. Yay. So that, and those are full scholarships. Yes. Full scholarships. Yes. Full Wonderful. Sto yes. So that's, that's what we're doing now. And so I am so happy and extremely happy because it's, it's all over the world. And it's, and it's helping kids chase their dreams as I chased to mine many years ago. And yes, what... Yes. Let it. You you knew baseball was going to be that for you. True. You knew and you said this is going to be the way that I'm going to. That's right. Move out and then later give to others. That's right. And some people don't. That, well, that's true. That's you know, And I, that's why I think people admire you. So well, thank much, you. That you've used your fame and you've used what you've done to help others. Well, I, I have tried with the help of my wife and uh, with the foundation. We have tried to, to do what we were called upon to do, you know, to try to help others. Now, you also did it in business, and I'm looking at Mr. Moorhead, because you were the first African-American BMW dealership ever. Yeah, we were. Now, yeah. I think you said, though, you only, this might be back with the $250. Two hundred dollar theme. You sold five cars the first. We didn't. I, we didn't sell too many BMW. <laughs> okay. We, we at, at least I. This my, is my a dealership, little theme here. At that time, my dealership was so small. We had a small dealership. I, I think Tom may have been a little larger than mine, but mine he was, the was second, so small. He was the second yeah, African American yeah, BMW yeah. dealer. But but thank God, you know, Mr. Moorhead has since graduated. And has gone on and done quite well. Thank God. Thanks, Tom. He's done very well. He, <laughs> he and George has done quite well. But but anyhow, it it it, um, it it gave me an opportunity to understand what being in business and what life was all about. You know, really, I have I've enjoyed myself. Uh, it's been something that I think that. Um, uh, we have helped other kids to fulfill their dreams. So we feel, feel quite proud of the fact that I have helped others. And you went into other businesses, the restaurant business? I mean, I'm in, I'm in the food business. Food business. Uh, yes. So you're just rolling. <laughs> I don't know. You're doing pretty good here. <laughs> well, that's We're, because it, it's a continuation of the... Um, excellence and striving mm -hmm. and it's back to your uh, parents and those values and what they taught you about being there and being steady well you know and keeping I, the course right and i tr and i have tried I, in spite of all the things that have happened to not only not myself but have happened in this country and especially to African-Americans, little kids, you know, and that was something that I think that made me and my wife talk about when we had our, not had, when we talked to our grandkid. You know, he's 14, 15 years old, 16 years old, and the most important thing is to make sure that he understands what life is all about. You know, when I was his age, I knew I, I had, my wife, my mother could, didn't tell me anything but one time. And after that, it was 
something else that was getting on my behind. <laughs> so she, she, that's what she told me. But, you know, these, today these kids are a little bit different, you know. And how do you, and you mentioned your um, one grandson is about 17? 17, yeah. And that you talk to him about yes. being, you use your experiences that you had. I use, I use my, my experience. And what I try to tell him is that no matter what happened, if he's driving a car, and, and today's kids are a little bit smarter than, say, I was when I was growing up, or really, to be honest. And I try to tell him, say, you know, the most important thing is that when, when, when someone stops you, want your driver's license, give him your license, put your hand on the steering wheel, or pull your hand up, and don't make a move. Just stay right there. That's kind of tough, but it, it's, it's tough. Kind of tough. It's kind Especially of tough. Especially for young people. Yeah, for but, young kids today. And your yeah. experiences, though, yeah. in Mobile and then traveling and stuff? Yes. Really reinforced that, though. Yes. And I, and I understood that. I understood that because growing up in Mobile, you, you understood that. But today, you know, young people, young kids, are not, you know, you, you have to explain things to them, and that's, that, and, and you should. You can't just walk up to one and say something and expect to, the, they, they want an answer, and they should rightfully have an answer, you know, really. Now, do you ever have um, young athletes come to you and ask for advice and things? I'm sure they... I have tried to stay out of that, really, and the reason for that is because I think that so many uh, young players today think that the agents think that you're trying to figure out a way to get some yeah. your hands in their pocketbook or something. And so I kind of stay away from that. You know, I try to help them as much as I can away from the, in the clubhouse, on the field, I'll talk to one of them about hitting or something. But I never try to kill one of them off the <laughs> <laughs> And that must be, you, you mentioned that um, you always thought that records were made to be broken. That's right. And that was your approach. That's true, that's true. And, and the reason for that is because for 23 years, I had I hit 750 some odd home runs. And Barry Bonds was slowly sniffing at my heels and he was, and, and people were saying that the reason that he was getting so close is because he was doing some things illegal. I didn't know he was doing anything illegal. I'd never known him, I'd never seen him do anything, really, to be honest with you. But that's what they were saying. And they were saying that, are you gonna give him the record? I said, I'm not giving him anything. I said, he again, I said, records are made to be broken. And no matter who it is, somebody's gonna break somebody's record, you know. Eventually. That's right. And if you look at it like that, you can move through your life. That's and, right. And keep going and feel good and do what you do. That's true. And that's what I think that when people talk about separating the record from the person is very important because you have that distinction. Now, another uh, distinction uh, that I think we will see in the exhibit, uh, people are going to see the baseball exhibit. And I mentioned that your scouting report from Branch Rickey is in there. Mm. But you don't know what he said. No, I got it. Well, I gotta, the whole I, world knows now. <laughs> <laughs> it's in the exhibit. I, I Let's just a, say he said you had potential. I have an idea. Uh -huh. I remember. I remember when I was playing in the Negro League many, many years ago, and uh, uh, I made two hundred dollars a month. That's what I was making, and I got a dollar a day meal money for eating. And it's a friend of mine named Jenkins. We were very good friends of mine. He and I were very good friends. And we used to buy a big jar of peanut butter about this so big. And it was real peanut butter. Peanut. This wasn't, this wasn't the kind that had oil on the top. This was a real <laughs> peanut butter. Okay, and, we and know And half of that. it would get right here and it would stick <laughs> to your throat. And he and I, he and I, 
I remember when I left Mobile, Alabama, and my sister carried me to the train station with a suitcase about this big. That's my suitcase. I call it a suitcase. It was a briefcase. <laughs> about this big, a pair of pants and a shirt. That was it. And I went to join the Indianapolis Clowns, the Negro League. And it was almost three and a half weeks before, and we played in Winston-Salem, South Carolina. It was cold as the dickens. I never forget, I, would, I, I didn't have a jacket, didn't have anything. And he, they, would, they wouldn't give me one because I was only a rookie. And I did the best, very best that I could. I froze at night, ate peanut butter, and that was it. But yeah, it, it you know, hey, I was I was 18 years old, and yeah. that didn't bother me. Yeah, that didn't bother me. I, I was I was I was happy as a lock. You know, I I wanted to I wanted to play baseball. You know, and, you were chasing a dream. I was chasing a dream. That's right, and I. I chased it. <laughs> and when you think about that, the, the peanut butter and the, the briefcase and what that led to, do you sometimes reflect back and say, wow? I think about it. Think I think about all of the things that I made $200 a month. That was my, and after taxes and all back then, of course, little taxes wasn't that much. But I used to send my mother all the rest of it. And I used to always have at least $25 or $30 in my pocket. And we never would, uh, we, we never would um, uh, travel on a train. We travel on a bus. And all of us had a, 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 a certain time, uh, not, not in the evening, but at night, we would be watching the turn, the signal, and helping the bus driver turn and drive the bus. But we, but, but we, we had a, we had, a, you know, you, you, you know, you think about things like that, you know, and you think, you say, how did I make it? How, what, what, what made me do? And I always say, you know, God works in mysterious ways. And sometimes he can have his hands on you and tell you what direction to go in. And you don't know why you're going in that direction, but you're going. So you have to say, you know, in spite of all the things that you have tried to do, somebody else stronger than you, most powerful than you, have sent you a direction to make you go in the right direction. And I feel like out of all the things that have happened to me in the 23 years that I played baseball and all the rest of the thing, that I had someone that was guiding me in the right direction in order to make sure that, Hank Aaron, we want you to go this way rather than going that way. I played baseball for 23 years, and I never ran with a crowd. Really? Never had, never had anybody. I didn't that, read that. Never had it. Ne never had anybody. Okay. Pulling my coattail, or anything like that. When I went through the chasing the Babe's record for many years, I stayed away from my teammates for a year and a half, and they stayed somewhere else. And I had to have people bring me food into the hotel. And for two years, I had to be left out of the ballpark, let in the back, go out of the back way rather than going out. Now, was that your yeah. choice or was that because no, that of was, those that threats? No, that was a choice because I, was I, getting, read about. I got all kinds of threatening letters. I must have had all kinds of letters that was threatening my life. You know, if I did this, if I did this, you know, so. Because of a record. Because of a record. And yeah. it was the racial part. It was segment racial, no question. Oh, uh, they kind of put that in the letter too. Yes. Yeah. And that was <laughs> yeah. Well, that was part of it. And for and that, I could imagine that that would almost take something 
the joy of doing it and you chasing your dream and playing and doing this and then to have that, wasn't that kind of bittersweet to have it, to no deal with about that it. too? And, and also, you know, at that time, you know, I, I was married, had two kids, and they were in school, and they couldn't, I had one daughter that was at Fisk University. Oh, yeah, in Nashville. Uh, yeah, she was at Nashville, and she, for a year and a half, she couldn't leave the campus because she was getting threatening letters. Your daughter. Uh, and so she couldn't leave the campus. And then I had to go, I had a little boy, I had two sons at Maris, another little private school, mm -hmm. but they too had to have people escort them here and there. And it was- uh, That was hard. It was, it, was a, it was a tough moment for me. And people remember it in their ways and they think about it, but they don't think about the human toll. That's right. And you were the human. That's <laughs> right. That you I weren't was. just some, you know, you were pretty phenomenal now. <laughs> pretty phenomenal. But you also were human and that, the toll that that took on you. Right. But no bitterness, no, you know, I mean, you just sitting here now. Well, you, you, as I said before, you, you know, you, 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 you think about all of the things that you, you went through, you, you're going through, and, and try to do the right thing, you know. And the most important thing I was trying to do was just bringing joy to people who wanted to see a little baseball, that's all. Now, what about the new generations? We talked about younger people. They're more uh, African-American youth seem to go into basketball and football. What about trying to get them involved with baseball? Do you think there's a There's a problem, and, and it's been a problem. You know, it's a problem I've talked to, uh, I've spoken to the commissioner of baseball about it. I've talked to both commissioner about it. And for some reason, uh, we don't have African Americans playing Major League Baseball anymore, you know, for some reason. Uh, most of your African American players are coming from the Dominican Republic and some of the other places, from some of the other islands, you know. And for some reason, we, you know, I was looking at the game last night, the other night when I think it was, uh, it was the ball, the, no, the Red Sox. Red Sox and they're Red Sox. <laughs> I know. <laughs> the Red Sox and and and, and the Houston Astros. Yeah. Can you imagine yeah. Mr. Henry Aaron yeah. watching games? Would you have loved to sit next to him while he's watching a game? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't see I didn't see I didn't see one African. I saw one African American. Isn't that something? Yeah, and and some clubs don't have any. And what about in the front office, too? Because that really is now. No, there is no, Mr. Ozzie News. Well, he's the ball. And we used to, and I remember when we played baseball, you know, myself and, and Willie and, uh, and some of the other players, we used to have, uh, that used to be, you have five players. You have players hitting 300, some players hitting 25 or 30 home runs. And all of them would be African American players, you know. But it wouldn't be reflected in the yeah. in the management and things like yeah. that later. No, no, we no, for some reason I don't understand it. We we've never broken that pillar yet, you know, management. Well, that's one to, to break. That's, that's, that's a right. record to break. That's true. That's a record to break. Yeah. Well, I'm just I must tell you that when, and I put down, and I told you I was a little nervous, so I had a lot of my questions right here, and I got a few, especially chasing the dream um, and helping young people see the possibilities. Mm -hmm. Now, they don't have to be involved in athletics, right? No. This is no, straight no. scholarship. It doesn't matter what they're majoring in. They can, they can be any, anything. We have kids, we have one kid playing golf. Is that right? And we have one playing the cello, oh. and we have one playing. Uh, we have kids at uh, at Stanford, and we have them all over Michigan. Michigan. Yeah. Okay, I think we will get some sports rivalries <laughs> going here. I, I can tell. So we so we got a, we have them all over. We we we've done we've uh, chasing the dream foundation 
it's been something that I think we, I am very proud of. And it is not only, we, we, have, we have white kids too now. Yeah. Oh, okay. so, so, so it's It's not kids. only just like, we have white, yeah. We have a school that we have white kids that's going to school under the same thing. So, but see, we have one at, at, at the University of Wisconsin, right? Mm -hmm. Ma Ma Madison too? Yes. So we, we have them all over. So I, I'm very proud. Not, you not should only, be. Yeah, these kids, are, these kids are doing wonderful. They are doing marvelous. And they, each one, every year, we bring them all to Atlanta. Bring them all to Atlanta for one game, and they all, and all of them, all of them usually show up. And they have a wonderful time. So yeah. this is the Atlanta Braves. So you, yes, you bring them there, the game, and, yeah. and they're yeah. uh, on the big screen. In the big screen, yes. And yes. everything like that. Have, and they have a lot of fun. Now, do you, you mentioned watching the game. So do you watch games a lot? Still? I do, and, and I, I watch it in, in, in my bedroom <laughs> at home. Do you? Do you? I don't, do I don't you, use it. Okay, that. I'm not going to ask you if you have any teams that you like or anything like that, because I know there's some people that would love to hear you talk about what teams you think are doing well. <laughs> Remember, I'm from Baltimore, so don't talk about that right now. But the Cubs made it finally. Yes. Is there any bank? Do you say yes. every year? Yes. Come out. So good. Yeah, they finally, finally made it. <laughs> they finally made it. The Cubs did, but um, you know, and and the commissioner, Commissioner Bud Siegel, have been instrumental in this panel. He's he's put together where you, you don't have the same team every year. You know, that was a time when you had the Yankees, 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 <laughs> Yankees every year, Brooklyn Dodgers, and Brooklyn Dodgers. That doesn't happen anymore. You know, I mean, it's it has been it has changed quite a bit now. And you've known him for how many years? Well, Bud and I have been knowing each other for hmm, at least 40, 50 years. Yeah. And you And he, he, he instrumental in my, my little thing that I give to each player every year. So he's, he's, he and I have been friends for a long time. He's, 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 done, he's done a great job with, when he was commissioner of baseball. And he's done, he, I would have to say he's done a great job with baseball, period. So before we end, I'm going to have to ask you, is there just one team that you're just kind of looking out at, at the team that you're kind of watching, you think? Go win? Oh, no. What? What about? No betting. <laughs> no, a team that's doing different things, or you're, you oh. enjoy watching. I don't know. I I think I would have to say without trying to put my, I would say Milwaukee. You know, Milwaukee. I see people going. Okay, Milwaukee. Milwaukee is done. Milwaukee. It's doing just about as well as it can be, you know, really. And that's not just because I played with Milwaukee for a long time, and, but it's because I think the management has has sought that seemed fit to really put the ball club where it's supposed to be, you know. Well, Mr. Aaron, even though you have done so much after those 23 years. I'm, I think a lot of us are still pleased that you are still interested in the game and, and looking, but also are helping so many other people chase their dreams. Well, thank you very much. We it, appreciate it, it, you it is, being it is, with us. It is so wonderful. But yeah, this is the first time I've been in this building. The very first time. I mean, this, this is something that uh, Everybody should come and see. And I mean, uh, it is, you You are doing just. Well, I work with some great people, yeah, and I'm yes. telling you, we brought out the good silver, right? Yeah. For Mr. <laughs> I mean, we had, oh, you name it, we had it. And it was out there, and the curators and librarians were so excited. And in fact, 
um, they are going to make sure that you see some of the Jackie Robinson letters. Mm -hmm. uh, and the archivist went back, Adrian Cannon uh, went back and looked into the archives and said, you do that because you were that aware that we had the Jackie Robinson. As I mentioned, you will see your scouting report in the baseball exhibit. Yeah, <laughs> Is it good? It was good. It was good. Like I said, he said you had potential. And he talked about you. And then we had something that we picked out um, from our archives. It's a map, a very rare map of Mobile, Alabama. Oh. And oh. it is rare and oh. old. It is the plan of Mobile, oh, Alabama. And we have it for you. Thank and we'll you. make sure you get it. But we wanted you, you to take a memento from the Library of Congress home Billy. with you. Yeah. Isn't that wonderful? We did that. We wanted to have Thank it. you. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah. So I know that people would like Thank to you. speak with you and um, just be with you for a few minutes sure. before we go on to dinner. Mm -hmm. And please, everyone, please thank Mr. and Mrs. Aaron uh, for being here today. Thank you.